Well, hello everybody, this is Simon in Sydney. I trust that you're having some stimulating conversations in uh, Washington. And uh, I'm very sorry that I can only be with you in spirit rather than in person this year. However, I hope that uh, this little provocation will uh, stimulate further debate and discussion as you think about the role of analytics in the creation of holistic formative higher education. So without further ado, I'm going to take a zip through um, the idea that language technology is getting to the point where we could usefully make sense of the kinds of reflective integrative writing which many of you are interested in. So picking up from last year's talk, uh, I'm not going to give much of an introduction to learning analytics, but um, you can pick that up from last year's uh, slide share and video. Instead, let's leap straight into the story of the formation by design learning journey. And we have here CARA as depicted in the interim report. And without going into all the detail of this very rich story, let's zoom in on a particularly interesting part of this figure, where a number of milestone moments are created for Kara along her learning journey. And of course, these are designed to displace her. I talked about liminal space last year, the sense of being betwixt and between what was certain and sure and as you enter a new unfamiliar territory this can have a disorienting effect but of course our job is to scaffold and support the learner through that to provoke meaningful reflection and we have these intriguing little icons here one of which refers to some kind of progress dashboard some kind of learning analytics visualization and the question is well exactly what might that look like and so the Formation by Design story talks about creating the opportunities for the learner to pause, reflect, make sense, and potentially revisit one's dashboard and share narrative reflections that represent uh, what you're interested in, where you're trying to get to. And it's this notion of narrative reflection that we're going to really focus on because, of course, an important form that that takes is writing. Now, why is reflective writing of such importance for formation by design? Well, there are um, quite a few scholars who have been uh, investigating this concept of reflective writing. I know many of you will have been under the, the heading of ePortfolios. Um, I have been um, getting into some of the literature around this and they talk about various levels of reflective writing. This might start from recounting simply what has been happening uh, in a work placement in a particularly um, stimulating project or perhaps in a rather boring series of lectures. Um, um, beyond that though we're looking for descriptions in academic and professional writing which are dem demonstrating the ability to use the technical vocabulary of the discipline you're looking for a critical voice where you're comparing and contrasting we're looking for evidence that you can start to explain what was going on um, both in terms of the disciplinary vocabulary but also reflections on what is going on perhaps inside oneself and we of course are looking for speculations of various sorts about the implications of a particular um, event or experience that comes from the work of Mary and Michael Ryan at Queensland University of Technology here's an intriguing quote from the work of uh, Reidsma et al. Uh, Rosalie Goldsmith is at UTS here with me and we'll be hearing a bit more about her work later. So it seems to me that some of the language that we find the scholarship of reflective writing using is really um, quite 
intriguingly close to the kind of language that we find in the FXD um, story. So for example, in analyzing reflective writing from engineering students, you can see that they discern three key themes. Ownership of learning, the formation of identity, in this case as an engineer, and the different navigational pathways that um, the formation of that identity uh, takes. And in this interesting diagram, you can see that here we have the core uh, accepted disciplinary knowledge that needs to be evidenced. There are various ways of navigating through uh, the experience. And we can see these very big words, identity, sense of ownership over learning, right in there as part of this new conception of what it means to be, in this case, an engineer. And we have reflective writing, which is giving voice to the lived experience of the student, which in, in turn is feeding back into an evaluation of how their learning journey is going. And Mesereau talks about the fact that if students are provided with opportunities to examine and reflect upon their beliefs, their philosophies and practices, then they are more likely to see themselves as active change agents and lifelong learners. And in this slide, coming again from Reidsma et al., they talk intriguingly about the fact that when they looked at the top and the poorest uh, performing students, they found that the, the weaker students were expressing agency which doesn't seem to be willing to take risks or accept responsibility. Um, it was the client that let me down. My client was not very enthusiastic. He only reminded us, etc., etc. It would be much better, at least, to have more guidance. There's a passivity there. Um, uh, there isn't a sense of ownership. Um, the student is still talking very much as a student and about how the course or the client let them down. Whereas they found that the strong engineering students displayed a lot more agency in their reflective writing. There was a lot more I rather than we. There was a lot more ownership and sense of responsibility in the writing compared to the example on the on the right, which is from uh, one of the, the weakest students, where they're still talking student speak, um, and it's very much we. And one of the summary graphs from their analysis, where you can see this graph is about your degree of negativity, and you can see in particular that spike around um, the course, the language used to describe the course, and in other graphs they show how the, the strong performing students were um, much more positive about the clients and the opportunities. And so you will have heard by now, I think, from Ruth Crick and the work she's been doing around the assessment of learning power. And I think we can see some interesting connections here to the notions of mindful agency as a real driving uh, variable in the whole story that she has been um, uncovering. The roles of the connections to sense making and curiosity and maybe we're seeing more hope and optimism in certain kinds of lifelong learners, um, certain kinds of students, sorry, which, which seems to be a proxy for a sort of lifelong learning attitude which feels confident enough to seize learning opportunities when they present themselves. And this notion of open readiness, which again is about the willingness to embrace a new opportunity to um, and to stick with it. This whole notion is a, is a sort of rich multi-dimensional notion of resilience, really. And so another quote from Ryan and Ryan that of course, with suitable support, students can reach a critical level and then the, the deeper, more active learning occurs. And we're talking here about sense making. It's a transformative approach to learning. We're trying to get the students to engage in knowledge transformation 
um, rather than just absorbing it, regurgitating it in a more passive kind of way. And perhaps we're even seeing the evidence of epistemological growth in reflective writing at its strongest. And so Rides Murtel talk about a distinct and challenging epistemological shift or disturbance in their beliefs of what actually counts as engineering disciplinary knowledge. Students wrote about how their conceptions had shifted of what it meant to, to be an engineer compared to just know about engineering. Okay, so there's hardly time for a lit review of the literature on reflective writing and how it can be taught and assessed. And of course, no time either really to look at the wide range of uh, language technology approaches for analyzing writing. So I'm going to zoom straight into a quick glimpse of the work that we've been doing here at UTS in collaboration with uh, Xerox Language Technologies and of course with our colleagues at Georgetown who are interested in reflective writing. So we have been developing a prototype parser for reflective writing. Uh, we are building on a technical platform developed at Xerox Research led by Agnes Shandor. My colleague Rosalie Goldsmith who works with me at UTS is a specialist in reflective writing in engineering and Sean Wang who is my web developer uh, and myself here at uh, Kick, have been thinking about how we can um, create a compelling user experience on top of the underlying language technology informed by the kinds of patterns that we think are significant for reflective writing very briefly, ZIP is the Xerox incremental parser. There's a detailed technical paper about how this works for those interested. But it goes through a series of steps um, in which different levels and depths of language technology, uh, sorry, of language parsing are conducted, along with concept matching, extraction of people, places, named entities, dates, um, and in particular, a particular set of rules about the dependencies um, that must exist between certain combinations of keywords in order to classify a sentence uh, within a particular framework. That framework, of course, is your theory of uh, learning, essentially. Your theory of how language relates to the, uh, the, the quality that you're interested in. So I'm going to step you through very briefly the kind of way in which we do this. So when we have a team like this together, we can ask our domain expert, our scholar of reflective writing, okay, what kinds of reflections do students engage in? So here's one called setting the context. Here is the description of what we're talking about. This is the context of the event that triggers the reflection. What was going on, where, who was involved, etc. And here's an example. By using examples of a hypothetical Georgetown students while discussing different parts of psychology and healthcare, I could make the connection that these, etc., etc., etc. Okay. So the uh, computational linguist then can say, aha, I can see here there may be a pattern. We must have something which reflects the author, the author's voice, a, uh, a first person statement, who is engaging in a reflection of some sort. And there must be a context marker of some sort. And you can see a definition here about what a concept context marker is. And then down at the bottom, you can see an example of the output when Zip has crunched this example and has tagged um, a number of these different key ingredients. And when these ingredients occur in any order within this sentence, then Zip will suggest mm, this looks like a, a context sentence, uh, a context setting piece of writing. Um, another criteria, another particular kind of reflection that we're interested in that, um, that our, our, our uh, reflective writing scholar gave us was specific information about. So we're not interested in vague statements about learning a lot or it made me reflect. Uh, we really are looking for 
detailed specific reflections. For example, over the past year I have come to realise that many of my close friends seek support and counselling through CAPS and outside healthcare providers. So again, the pattern here is that we want an author to be reflecting in some way um, on something, but it doesn't include a shift word. We'll hear about what shift words are in a minute. Okay. So I have come to realise that many of my close friends seek. Okay. So the friends are doing something. I have realised something in particular. Here's another example. The course made me think about the ways I can contribute to the healthcare system. I realised I could make a difference in people's lives. These are statements about a shift in capability. I, I have sensed that, uh, you know, I see in myself an increased confidence or ability to do something, to make a difference. Okay, and again, here's the example of how that sentence, that example, is annotated automatically by the parser and hence classified accordingly. Okay, and there are more. There are more examples. Another, here's one, a shift in perception. Um, another example, I can already see that my attitude towards the university has changed. This one is an author who must reflect in some way, but it includes a shift word. And of course there is a lexicon of these shift words which we can extend, tune or prune. Now, that's the new parser that we've been developing specifically around the kinds of autobiographical reflective writing that um, many of you are interested in. I gave examples last year of the other kind of writing that Zip is um, uh, able to parse, which is more traditional critical analytical uh, writing. And we, we have talked about this as academic meta discourse, the kind of thing you see in a research paper which claims to be making a contribution to the field. And again, without going into great detail, you can see in black the kinds of rhetorical moves that we typically see in a publication of some sort. Um, and in purple, some examples of how you use language to accomplish these moves. So when we process a text, we are both conducting an analytical analysis of it, as well as a reflective analysis now. The third element, in addition to the parser and the domain expert, who has a view about what counts as effective writing, is the user interface. And here are a couple of screenshots from the academic writing analytics tool we've been developing here at UTS, or AWA as we call it. So you paste in your text on the home page there. And it generates um, reflective output, which you can see here. And you can see we're emphasizing to the student that uh, this tr seeks to highlight sentences that are exemplifying reflective writing. But of course, AWAR doesn't know if you're talking simply beautifully crafted nonsense. That's up to you to ensure. And you can see um, the list of extracted highlighted sentences there and when you roll over one of those sentences you can see the function keys CA and CO the, the tooltips explain to you that that sentence there seems to be to do with a statement about my capability I feel more comfortable talking in a group setting uh, and uh, as though I can contribute my thoughts and there's clearly something about the context there as well it's a group setting The analytical writing report is the one I just talked about, which is looking for analytical, argumentative or scholarly rhetorical moves. And you can see down the right hand side there the key based around that slide I just showed you of the different kinds of moves and the different ways of using language. Now analytical parsing in fact does seem to work uh, to a degree when we process reflective writing. So for example, uh, here's an example where the parser has flagged novelty of some sort. So this course really opened my eyes to some new issues I'd not been aware of before. 
and even to some of the problematic ways I have been taught about my own identity. So that's a pretty profound reflective statement. It was spotted by the parser because language had been used to refer to new issues and not being um, uh, aware of something. Um, so it's it's picked it out and it's done. You know, it's kind of got a it's got a hit there. Um, in fact, it's picked it out because that language is also used in academic scholarly pieces where you claim to be perhaps raising new issues or talking about the limitations of previous work. Um, the professor's approach, however, taught me not to not dismiss such ideas as quickly as I was used to doing, but to analyze the writings, etc., etc. Now, so there are a lot of cues in there which refer to, in an academic piece, you might expect the author to be contrasting um, uh, violated expectations. You know, um, There's lots of language there to do with, whilst one thing might have been the case, in fact, it turned out to be a different story. And again, it's, it's picked out that statement, and we would probably agree that that is a reflective statement that refers to uh, you know, quite a significant shift uh, in the in the learner's mind. And here's another one, emphasis, which is used to highlight importance um, in academic writing. Here, the 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 student is saying that this was one of the most important classes I had all semester, and I grew as a person. Now, because we actually are analysing the wrong genre here, you do get a lot of noise as well. And so there are many, many examples um, of picking out sentences which superficially appear to be looking like important moves in academic writing, but really they're not terribly profound statements when you think about how reflective they are. The tool also generates a whole bunch of visualizations to provoke reflection through good old wordles. Uh, a slightly more sophisticated version where you can see uh, phrases as well, essential interconnectedness, ethnicity inequality, um, and um, that's a slightly more sophisticated extraction of n-grams from the uh, from the writing. Uh, it will extract certain kinds of named entities. For example, we we can flag the places you talk about. We can talk about the people that you mention. Uh, there are many other kinds of named entities that can be detected. And we also generate some simple summary statistics that give you a view of the uh, the relative frequencies with which you are using the different kinds of, in this case, uh, reflective mood moves. Okay, so very quickly I'm going to share with you what we've been doing in terms of applying this parser to a corpus of reflective writing from Georgetown. And the, um, the colleagues at Georgetown have hand analyzed the reflective writing and coded it using quite a high um, threshold of uh, looking for deeper kinds of reflections. Almost everything in their corpus was reflective writing of some sort, but they were looking particularly for deeper reflection and particularly where it's showing a shift in, in one's reflection about oneself or, or the domain or the world. Uh, and here are some examples which show the different kinds of uh, statements. I won't read them all out, but you can see they're talking about either the course or some shift in yellow about um, the domain or the world or a deeper green reflection about oneself. So the $20 million question, of course, is, well, when a human highlights text, and a machine highlights text, what's the nature of the match? And one way of uh, analyzing this is to uh, use um, the notion of signal detection theory where we have true positives and true negatives where ZIP, the machine, is spotting the same things that the human analysts spot. On the other hand, we might have false positives or false negatives where the, um, the, the parser is um, flagging something which actually it should not be flagging 
or it's leaving blank something which the analysts thought was important. Okay, so here's an example. Looking back on the semester, I don't think I could have felt as comfortable, etc., etc., picked out by the parser. So we've got a true positive there. But this sentence was left blank by the human analysts, and there's a wide range of reasons why they might not have highlighted something. Um, but it was highlighted by the parser. And arguably, that is in fact um, a reflective statement. Uh, that we might be interested in. Um, and I'm noting here that we, we do expect many false positives from this particular corpus because the human analysts were setting the bar quite high in what they chose to highlight in their manual annotation. So we step through the whole corpus and we code against true positives and false negatives and false positives. And this allows us ultimately to calculate a bunch of metrics that are commonly used in information retrieval around precision, recall, and accuracy. And you can see what the figures look like at the moment. So this is version 0.1 of the parser. And um, you can see it's, it's done a fair job. We've got a lot of false um, positives as well, though, um, which the analysts did not highlight. And that's largely because a lot of the text is reflective in any case. It left blank many of the um, things that the analysts also left blank, but it was also missing some of the things they highlighted. And so we are reflecting now on how the parser could be improved to better detect the patterns that the analysts were highlighting. And so just to conclude, we opened with Kara on her learning journey, and I've given you um, a little glimpse of where we might be going in terms of being able to generate a dashboard of some sort which feeds back to them the extent to which they're meaningfully reflecting on their learning journey. So is this a new tool for Cara? Is this a new tool for her mentors, for the academics who are trying to track her progress? And how do you respond to the examples I've shown you? Does this excite you or appall you, perhaps? Do you think the machine is finally doing something that uh, really is getting at deep learning and reflection? Or have we trivialized the phenomenon in the process of trying to formalize it? Can you see some risks of an approach like this? Can you see opportunities and use cases for this that uh, might open up new kinds of quality conversations? So, over to you, and um, thanks very much, and I look forward to hearing what you come up with.